I'm Mark Rambo. I'm the president of the Sturgis Mead County Historical Society. I want to thank everybody for participating in this year's History Day. Um, this is our fifth year doing it, and Historical Society is about six years old at this point. So we're excited for the growth and the uh, dynamic programming and all that kind of stuff that we've been able to, to come up with and with stuff to come down the road yet. You know, we're just getting started and we're very excited about some of the potential for a collection we're starting to build um, of materials and people starting to contact us about photographs and newspapers and grandma's stuff and you know those kind of things. So uh, things are starting to roll and we're we're excited to get to get it moving faster. But you know, growth is is gradual and we're uh, we have the opportunity to kind of grow and and do things properly as we go along too. So uh, today we're celebrating the 130th anniversary of Mead County. Um, and our speaker is gonna be talking a little bit about the uh, Titan Missile program. So I'll introduce him here. Um, Tim Belder, born and raised in Newell, has been easily distracted by local history tales since his <laughs> college days at Black Hills State University. Tim generally focuses on topics not in the attention-grabbing areas of local history, and he's proud to say he has only done one presentation on Custer and none on Calamity Jane, Wild Bill, and <laughs> During his 20-year career reporting and editing newspapers in the northern Black Hills, Tim has taken advantage of the resources of pioneer families and old file copies of newspapers to dig deeper into the details um, and happenings of Meade, Lawrence, and Butte counties. He has also taken advantage of the resources of the Newell Museum, where his mother, Linda, is curator. After leaving the newspaper world in 2010, Tim settled with his wife, Jerry, and three teenage children in Sundance, Wyoming, where he works in marketing and communications for the Powder River, and for Powder River Energy, the electric cooperative for Northeast Wyoming. Well, welcome, Tim Belder. <laughs> I thought that was backstage, but it's the restroom, so <laughs> here I come out of the bathroom. So uh, here's a, a little presentation that kind of nagged at me a little bit. It uh, was something I'd heard of. I knew there was different missile sites around. Um, and that was mainly in my childhood upbringing where you saw Air Force vehicles driving around and helicopters flying over and didn't really pay much attention to it, but uh, in this case, Titan missiles were a different thing when I'd go down with my wife to Buffalo Gap to visit her mother. There was a missile road that takes off from Highway 79 East. And just kind of see it every time I drove by, didn't think much of it. And then one day I was listening to the state high school basketball tournament and Newell was playing and Bob Julius mentioned somebody he saw in the crowd from the old Titan missile days. So then, okay, now I gotta dig a little deeper. So here we go. Okay. So we're all probably familiar with the uh, Cold War of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, the combatants built weapons and installations to show strength and capability, but although the two sides came close to a conflict a couple of times, not a single shot was fired from either side. Um, the Cold War between the United States and its allies against communist forces, primarily the Soviet Union, was a 50-year standoff for two major military powers with nuclear weapons. And from the United States side, the war started when World War II ended. Uh, the detonation of two nuclear bombs upon Japan to close out the war demonstrated massive destructive potential of the technology. And millions of people could be killed or wounded when entire cities were leveled by the nuclear bombs. And I was lucky that we were late starting because I discovered that this is the presentation I wanted to show. The other one that was on the screen earlier was my previous <laughs> attempt. So this is a little bit different. If not better, just different. Okay, so the Titans were developed in the late 1950s during a time of high tension between the United States and the Communist Soviet Union. Both countries had nuclear weapons. And political rhetoric heightened fears that the Soviets would attempt an attack on the United States. Um, the American military believed the Russians' long-range striking capability was ahead of U.S. technology. The United States pressed a missile defense program into production. At first, the military planners at Strategic Air Command, or SAC, 
feared the attack from bomber squadrons that could disable a country by leveling key cities and strategic areas. Any non-nuclear country that was threatened would be immediately faced with the prospect or the choice of surrender or total annihilation. These are just some uh, propaganda posters that you might recall. Uh, the Turtle One was a cartoon song that you'd have to learn in school. Duck and cover. You see the flash and you go, duck and cover. So, um, let's see. Ellsworth Air Force Base was selected as a site for the initial defense system of Nike missiles, and this is not Ellsworth Air Force Base. Uh, this is, I think, out in Vandenberg in California. The Nike missiles were placed at key U.S. targets to ward off planes carrying atomic bombs. And the Nike was designed to be effective in taking down airplanes but couldn't knock down missiles or deliver a warhead to targets in the Soviet Union. SAC commissioned the Titan program in 1955 to create long-range strike capability. And developing a missile program was not an overnight success or process. Uh, planners took a page out of the World War II playbook and started parallel development programs so a chance of at least one being successful would be increased. The missiles were successfully test-fired in 1959. This just gives kind of a little timeline of what was happening during those years, and it was uh, big business. So here's the fun part. We're going to see if this works. Okay, so these are a couple of videos uh, that purport to show the Titan One in action. I couldn't see it on my screen, but I could see it on that screen. They are really cool videos too. It's right here. Yeah, you see what you're missing. Okay, so we're used that far. Well, I'll show you the videos later. It basically shows a missile taking off, which we've seen a billion times, and another one of a missile exploding on the launch pad. And, the, uh, and I'm not going to get into too much of the technical stuff about feet, inches, centimeters, and chemical reactions and all that kind of stuff, but the Titan missiles were uh, fueled by liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen or kerosene. And the missiles were designed, tested, and deployed in a public manner to send a message that the strike against the United States would culminate in the aggressor's annihilation. And none of the Titans were ever fired at an enemy, and they were never tested in the Black Hills area. This is a really bad map. The Titan One missile program launched Ellsworth Air Force Base in western South Dakota in the thick of the Cold War. Ellsworth and the Great Plains were key bases for the Cold War operations through the end of the early 1990s. And you can see the different states where uh, Air Force bases were located and assigned the missile program. Um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers selected various sites in the western United States for the Titan bases, including the area around Ellsworth Air Force Base. And this just gives some general directions of where they were at. Uh, many local people were involved directly and indirectly in the massive Titan One base construction project that dominated the news and provided a major economic boost to the area from 1959 to about 1962. Uh, former Rapid City Journal editor Jim Keane watched the construction of the missile bases firsthand and covered the issue extensively. Uh, he told me in 2002 that the project was remarkable because intercontinental ballistic missiles were arriving in South Dakota and the Titans made quite an impact on the mission of Ellsworth Air Force Base. <coughs> uh, this is a Rapid City Journal file photograph of the construction of a Titan missile site possibly near Wicksville. Uh, in a 1969 Hermosa area history book called Our Yesterdays, Ann Lindsay wrote, the building of the Titan missile base caused a three-year boom around this place. Uh, the Air Force officials chose 12 colonels to head Titan base construction projects around the United States, and among them was Colonel Kenneth Northam, uh, a veteran pilot from World War II and Korea who led the Black Hills area work. Northam and other Colonels were given an edict to start. I'm trying to get my thing here. 
to start and complete the job with specific timeline. And North Dakota said the time program has made a top priority. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers selected various sites in the Western United States for the Titan basis, including the area around Ellsworth. Uh, contractors Lovell and Scott got the contract to build all three sites for a price of approximately $10 million per base. Whoop, too far. Now, each center had three missiles. The bases were impenetrable from above the ground, but the missiles were vulnerable when they were raised out of their 160 foot deep silos. After fueling and preparation for launch, it would, took about 8 to 13 minutes would elapse between the time the hatch doors were opened and the missile was ready for launch. If the missile was fired, which never happened here, it would have been armed after launch to explode on impact. <coughs> so that, uh, remember that 8 to 13 minute time frame. Uh, this 3D image shows three launch silos. It's not from a James Bond movie, <laughs> but it isn't quite as accurate as the next slide. But each site was set up like a small underground city, self-contained, uh, if all outside resources were cut off in a nuclear attack. It looks much more like a science fiction drawing, but it is fairly good at depicting the deep dig needed to put in the facility underground. Each Titan complex consisted of 360 foot deep silos, guidance facilities, control centers, living quarters, air handling equipment, and connecting tunnels. Huge holes were dug with monstrous concrete structures, but because they were underground and away from major highways at the time, people eventually uh, forgot they were there. This is more of a horizontal view and more labeled. Uh, this horizontal image shows the general configuration of the tunnels and launch silos. There was a tremendous amount of dirt work and structural steel needed to make it strong enough to withstand a nuclear blast. Some said the project was designed by people who had no regard for taxpayers' dollars. The Rapid City Journal printed several photos and news stories about the construction, which was of most interest to Black Hills residents. The missile was a two-stage system and it produced a tremendous thrust, but the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen were dangerous to work with. Hydrogen and oxygen manufacturing plants were at Ellsworth. Uh, Colonel Northam replaced a 24-hour guard at the plants because they were very volatile. The infrastructure alone ended up costing about $42 million in 1961. So I don't know how many more zeros you got to add to that for today's dollars. Uh, with instruments and missiles, the total cost of the South Dakota basis was about $330 million. Around Hermosa, a trailer court was created east of town with room for 30 homes. It was full and all available housing in town was taken up. Many workers commuted from Rapid City and Hot Springs. This was such a hermosa site. <coughs> they also added that with all the new people in town and all the activity, the only death in Hermosa that was connected in any way to the Titan was a heart attack of one of the workers. Okay, so this is an aerial photograph of the Wicksville Titan missile site. This one was a little more defined and intact. That's what it would look like today. Uh, it's still a viable well and is a public water source according to the South Dakota Rural Water System. Um, after deactivation, the bases were stripped of much of the high-grade metals inside, and the government left most of the steel and iron and concrete. Now, this is an aerial photograph of the Sturgis type missile site. The uh, large white building on the upper left is uh, new and it's been built recently. The three launch silos are still visible in the top of the photograph. Uh, the property was listed for sale a year ago for more than $250,000. The owner from Nebraska is a salvage company and still owns it as of a couple months ago when I talked to the county. Uh, this is the aerial view of the uh, Hermosa Titan missile site. And if you're ever flying in from Denver to Rapid City, you'll fly right over the top of it. And if you really know what you're looking for, you'll see those right below you as you're coming in for the landing. And uh, it gives the best picture of where everything was. Three launch silos, the control area, radar, etc. Trees are springing up along the roads. And everything under there, including the mess halls and the sleeping quarters, were designed so people could have a safe haven to launch their missiles upon direction from higher headquarters. The go button would light up green upon command from headquarters at Ellsworth. 
a 4,000 kilowatt diesel powered generator at each site supplied enough electricity to serve a community of about 27,000 people. Wells could provide 18,000 gallons of water per an hour to cool the power plant. Uh, the missile crewmen had facilities for eating and sleeping and everything was encased in a thick layer of concrete and dirt. Rehearsal went so much better, it should have been. <laughs> uh, it was a mammoth construction job. Uh, Colonel Northamer said it was the biggest construction project he had ever seen. Construction at the site brought in hundreds of workers, and the work started first at Hermosa and then moved to, in stages to Wicksville and Sturgis. At its peak, the project employed 2,000 people. The payroll exceeded $1 million per month. The South Dakota cement plant provided all the concrete. The flurry of activity created optimism in the northern Black Hills circles. The First National Bank uh, reported a $4 million gain in deposits just in 1960. And American National Bank, which I don't know who they are today, showed a $2 million gain that year. Now, many ranchers were facing drought and sought work at the missile sites, but they found competition from outsiders. And the United States economy was teetering on recession in 1960, and many unemployed people headed to the Black Hills, hoping to find work at the Titan Project. With the rush of workers, unemployment figures actually increased in 1960, despite the thousands of new jobs that were created by the Titans. When the bases were finished and activated in 1962, SAC employed about 700 people to maintain and operate the sites. Uh, this is a picture of the it was a picture of the Sturgis front gate, not this year, but a couple of years ago. Very beautiful, it's just barely visible in the background. Okay. Okay, so Northmore said the South Dakota weather and geology challenged the contractors. Heat, cold, heavy clay soil, and long hours pushed the deadlines of the base builders. Uh, Northmore played mediator during problems with labor and was always able to get the people together on labor and management. Leonard Hansen of Sturgis and Bob Julius worked at the Titan construction sites and uh, marveled at the size of the project. Hansen was a dirt worker and a security guard at the Titan site until SAC took it over in 1962. Uh, he said the work was done on a tight schedule but was meticulous. Workers packed the dirt around the tunnels and inspectors would stop work every few minutes to check it. The dirt had to be kept dry, and steps were taken not to let it get too wet. The dirt packing had to, um, let's see, the dirt packing had to be perfect so it could stand up to a bomb blast. Skilled engineers worked in the facility assembling the technical hardware with pinpoint accuracy. Everything had to be precise because every missile had certain fittings that had to tie in with the construction. Hansen said he also worked as a, uh, let's see, that's a double, very similar. Okay. Uh, the more things they installed, the higher the clearance you needed to be there. So as they moved closer and closer to go time, and not everybody could take a look at what was happening. Uh, Hansen said everything inside just shined because the copper and stainless steel equipment was polished in a dust-free environment. Northamer said that uh, Local workers, uh, local workers, ranchers, and townspeople understood the importance of the project. Uh, he said tension was really high in his outfit because he had to emphasize the strategic importance of finishing with quality installation in a short time. And he said uh, the locals respected the uniform in those days. So you didn't have to be in the military to uh, take orders. He attended numerous town hall style meetings to keep the locals updated on the progress and the schedule. Bob Julius was a uh, Sturgis teacher and coach in the early 1960s. He had to provide for his wife and children, but didn't make enough money on an educator's salary. Julius and his friend Owen Christopher applied for Titan based construction jobs in the summer of 1961 with American Machine and Foundry, commonly known as AMF. AMF is the same company known for making bowling equipment. Uh, the following is Julius's account of his entry into the Titan Missile Program. So 
So Bob said uh, things were so tight, it was hard just to get gas to run down there to get to the interview. They hired us on the spot, and they were in a rush to get the bases up and running. They looked at our college backgrounds and hired us to work in configuration control at the Sturgis site. After we left the interview, I asked Chris, his nickname for <coughs> Christopher, what's configuration control? <laughs> and Chris said, I don't know, I thought you knew. <laughs> okay, so the men were hired to handle blueprints for the construction and keep track of the change orders during the process. They worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week. They were paid handsomely in regular wages and overtime wages until the site was completed in 1962. Julius later worked for the Boeing on its construction of the Minuteman and the site. Okay. Alright, so after the sites were completed, they were turned over to SAC. And the characteristics of it, that's what it looks like now, probably underground in Colorado. Uh, the characteristics of the Titan One requiring <coughs> elevation out of the ground um, made it vulnerable because it had to fuel it before you could fire it. So in theory, you could take them out before they ever got in the air if you were a hostile enemy. People who followed the missile arms race were amazed when the solid fuel capabilities of the Minuteman changed the technology of missile warfare. Uh, the Titan missiles were nowhere comparable to that. And after deactivation, the bases were stripped of much of the high-grade metals inside, and the government left most of the steel, iron, and concrete. There were later 150 Miniman missile silos and launch control centers positioned throughout uh, the South Dakota Prairie. Many of the people who developed the early Titan technology went on to develop further missile science and manned rocket technology, including the program of the two man on the moon. Okay. Here we go. And this is the locked gate at the Hermosa missile site. Uh, the, gate, the site's water well is also being used for community water. After less than three years of around-the-clock readiness, SAC shut down and salvaged the three sites in 1965. Wells at two sites have provided water for residents much longer than they ever served as a missile launcher. Now, the military is in a constant state of improving its missile weaponry. And the brief Titan One era was a race between Russia and the United States for who had the best capability. Northamer said that the massive expenditure of the project was critically timed because it showed the Soviets we could strike from halfway around the world from impenetrable sites away from large cities. And so if you notice, except for the California coast, a lot of these sites were in remote areas around the Rocky Mountains away from the coasts where the people live. There are people live here too. <laughs> the important people live here. Uh, so today the weeds push up through the cracks of the asphalt roads and the wind whistles through the blue-gray steel fences. And clumps of grass dig into what was once an impenetrable concrete base. And these are the remnants of the Titan One missile program buried beneath 40 feet of South Dakota Prairie for 50 years of time. Maybe a little more than 50 years now. Um, so you saw the rusty interior of what's still there in some of the places around. And uh, just wanted to share this picture. Um, you may remember that team that played in Sturgis. This was 1968, but I don't know when they disbanded in the early 70s. But, uh, I think the Sturgis baseball team still calls themselves the Titans. Mm -hmm. So and the field is still Titans. And there's a rocket still sitting yeah. there. So yeah, the and they're having a great the season this year too. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that's if you ever wondered why they were called that, I think that's why. So um, there's just some of my resources that I used for the for the, today's presentation and. And don't mind listening to questions. If you have stories, I'd really like you to write them down and share them. <laughs> but uh, you don't have to tell them to me, so you just write them down and we can add them to the story. So, but yeah, I might be able to answer a few questions if there's anything. Yeah, I was going to mention Chuck Rabbit was the name. 
1960, I was an apprentice carpenter in Rapid City. And uh, the labor union in Rapid City had a contract, federal contract, of course. Uh, we built scaffolding out at the Wicksville site. And as far as I can tell, it was basically a boom novel because uh, they didn't read very much scaffolding. Uh, they kept the apprentice carpenters busy uh, just walking around. That was walking yeah. around. That was really typical of the country of Governor Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, you're more than qualified, I'm sure. <laughs> we got paid for it. <laughs> boom. Yeah, I, 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 they didn't talk, when I talked to the colonel, um, he retired, obviously, a long time ago, but uh, he didn't get into the government waste part of it. He was really still behind it as a critical mission project. Yes, sir. Oh, well, uh, I'm Chief Captain Ray. I was one of the ranchers that worked there. Okay. I was just a young one. Pretty new to us. <laughs> but we lived about six miles from the Sturgis site. Okay. And I was a security guard there for well, just about a year, I guess. Which was a job we had several sites that we had to sit at and then we'd, somebody walked around all the time. So I got to tour the whole base. And it was really an interesting thing. I was about a quarter of a mile from one end to the other. So there we floor in there that you didn't mention were all suspended on springs. So they just withstand the shock, I guess. Mm -hmm. oh. But they had enough computer stuff in there to bring and fill this building to find a book yeah. at that time. Yeah. And they had four great big diesel engines down there to generate that. I mean, they were big. They had pistons in them. <laughs> Not that big on them. It was... Uh, it was interesting because we got to do more than anybody else as far as we didn't do any work, but we wandered around there, <laughs> wandered around and carried our guns. But, <laughs> but anyway, the, just the fact that they were all suspended on those. And then after it closed up, we built a whole bunch of krells, well, a site for hogs, and I purchased almost all my pipe for posts and stuff. Salvage out of there. So I had, not only worked there, but I had. <laughs> that's the benefit of the salvage out. And those holes are still still within about 40 feet of the top of the ground with water. So they were all full of water. Yeah. They had a terrible time keeping it empty while they were building it. So they're just, you know, so far as I know, still, it's still all there. Yeah. It, it's, Last yeah. picture I have in the water. They just slammed the door on it. And it's <laughs> privately owned, and so there's there was somebody who tried to salvage stuff out of it. I don't know if they could. They tried to sell it, but no buyers. <clears throat> so maybe there's a chance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wishing from the property. Yes, sir. I'm Clint Jolly. I remember there was a time shortly after those were finished, they put the missiles up, and they couldn't get them out. Oops. Oh. Elevators only work one way. <laughs> but a few years ago on the History Channel, I ran into a program about them. And they said that shortly after they were done, they put the missiles up and they were up on purpose. And they didn't come down on purpose because they were fueled, loaded, ready to fire because we were in a world crisis. <laughs> but the government started the rumor that they were stuck. Oh, so they might make you worried. Yes. <laughs> Well, yeah, they might have been the Cuban Missile Crisis. What was that, 2016? Yeah, oh, right in that time frame. So, it wouldn't surprise me. But yeah, you, they, I think a lot of it was posturing. They wanted to just show, okay, here's all our stuff. You want to take us home and try it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, when I was teaching school in Lemon, they had like CDM, there. We had to do air raid drills every once in a while and go to like air shelters or wherever. So they were taking it pretty serious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was a regular deal. And I think it all started with the turtle cartoon. 
it was in New York City, they had a false alarm scare, and they were shocked at how poorly the response was by the public. Uh, nobody took it seriously, nobody really wanted to engage, they thought, let's go out and see what's coming, what was the siren for? <laughs> so they did a national campaign to train the populace how to respond to a nuclear attack. And uh, so there's still buildings all over around with those triangle signs on them, right. they're still standing. This is the bar. Now we use it for children. Yeah. 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 So, but yeah, this, there, I still, there's one in, in Sundance that's still stuck on a building now. Mm -hmm. It could be used for that. I think the grocery store in Newell still has one outside of their buildings. So. And the site at Fort Meade, I think, is still, still there. Mm -hmm. um, last I knew, it still had the biscuits and water. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's the old uh, root cellar. Yeah, we've yeah. Yeah, we got a barrel of lemon candy out of one of them. That was oh. <laughs> we were going to leave them out if things went south. <laughs> 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 lemon candy. Anyway. So yeah, that's, that's that one. And then, like I said, it kind of follows you around and you hear stories from people and they make comments. And so you keep track and you just try to do your best to get a story put together. And there's a lot more out there on these and technical stuff. And, and uh, I don't, I didn't really get into that too much because I want everybody to try to stay awake best of the So tell me what you're saying was that the Minuteman was to get a plane that was coming. No. no. The no. Nike was the first one. That was to just shoot down planes. That, that was the Nike. That was the first fear that we had is they were going to bomb us from airplanes. So let's get the Nike and those set up at, at different Air Force bases to shoot down those planes. Okay. So then, then the missile came next. So then, what was their capability? Could they, they go? How far would they go? They could get Moscow. Moscow. These yeah. could get Moscow. What about Minuteman then? Yes. And they could get Moscow. Yeah. yeah. And then. And yeah. Oh, if, oh, that's all further we wanted to go. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean that was that was the intent was that we're going to strike you from here. We're out in the middle of nowhere. You can try in our cities, but we're going to be able to respond here and get you back. So if you could blow up the York, that's fine. We're going to get you back. So the, the, Nike, the Nike sites were, as you said, located principally around military installations. And they were run by the Army. That was an air defense artillery mission that was still the province of the United States Army, protecting Air Force bases. And so there was this green and blue, uh, not tension, but relationship that had to be worked out between the Army and what was still the really relatively new Air Force. Yeah. Uh, and so there were professional differences and other issues that went on. And then that Nike mission, uh, not here in South Dakota, but in other places where it lasted longer, was given to the National Guard. Okay. And the National Guard ran the Nike sites until that technology and other things happen to make it irrelevant. Um, and those full-time National Guardsmen who worked at the Nike sites uh, had reemployment rights, uh, in a manner of speaking. And it took decades for those men who wanted to still stay on the government payroll to accept jobs, and uh, full-time National Guard jobs around the nation, um, and eventually get absorbed into the system through attrition and right. what have you. And so the Nike sites that were around Ellsworth were run by the Army, not the National Guard, because they went out of business much sooner than Nike sites located elsewhere uh, in the country. It had nothing to do with the shoe company. And, and, the, and the Nike, when the Nike sites were salvaged then, that dumped a whole bunch of equipment and spare parts and things like that and the, the launching rails for the Nike sites got used in western South Dakota to build bridges and other things here there and on farms and ranches and those of us in the room who remember Mel Hendrickson who was my neighbor uh, or our neighbor on Comanche Court Mel got a couple of pieces of the Nike rails and built a bridge in his backyard to span Deadwood Creek so that he could drive his car off the alley of Fulton Street 
into his backyard without coming up Mead Avenue. Oh. And this, these Nike rails and some pine logs that he got from his cabin probably up in, the, in Vanocker Canyon got put together. And I think he drove over it two or three times and that was, he, he proved that he got it done. <laughs> And then maybe the city or someone said, you know, now no, this uh, no, Cecil Barnes had a footbridge yeah. and um, that we kids all used, but this car bridge was uh, a bridge too far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Adaptive <laughs> reuse. Yeah. Yeah. But Mr. Mr. Henderson, Major Henderson, got yeah. got me because he was an extra guard officer as well, um, okay. and uh, he got it done and, uh, to his credit, and then it got taken apart. And, Disappeared. Yeah, well, that's a. Uh, that reminder of stories, too, about different people who got different parts from different things. Yeah. I think the military was a little more open with, yeah, you want something, we'll surplus it, you know, you or sell it. Or yeah, and economically, I think you can't, you can't say enough about the jolt of cash, wages, uh, employment that got injected into Western South Dakota at a time when it was very welcome. And that made a huge difference in the, in the pocketbooks of a lot of families yeah. in Western South Dakota. Yeah. And that, you know, the taxpayer's dollars were available then. It was a critical real time mission. So. Yeah. And it's like that today. I mean, it, it is. It, 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 the technology changes, the systems change, and what have you, but it's still. It's DOD money that yeah. uh, gets put in the economy. It'd be kind of, you'd probably never find out, but it'd be nice to know how they selected the sites. Was politics involved, or if it was a strategic problem? Yes. So, um, why did they what, make it? Senator Case was in office, Carl Munt, um, EY Berry. You know, those would have been federal decision makers yeah. at that time. Yeah. I-90 was a strategic military yep. avenue, too, so sure. it makes oh, sense yeah. to yeah. locate it there. The geography of where we are. Yeah, exactly. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.